So you've all been watching and listening to the news this week, and you know that uh, you may know that this morning IOM has announced that we will be returning 15,000 migrants from detention in Libya. The uh, young man beside me has been on a similar journey, so I think this will be a particularly enlightening conversation. Uh, <clears throat> we have plenty of time to discuss it, and we're going to be talking about their personal stories, but also learning a lot about the issue of irregular migration through West Africa, the role of the so-called connection men, the famous connection men, who encourage people to take very dangerous journeys, the role of social media in encouraging these journeys to happen through instant communication between people and the connection men, and then the terrible things that can happen when you arrive somewhere. I'm not going to ruin the story, but uh, just to let it unfold naturally. And on my left, I've got uh, Fabiola, who's from Brazil, who uh, spent many, many years in this country, in Switzerland, and then due to economic conditions, decided to return home and had to figure out how to do that at a time of great personal stress and economic stress. <clears throat> my colleague on my right, Agustin, is from Nigeria. He too was a victim of the economic circumstances, as so many people in the world today tend to be, uh, and decided that nothing was happening in his career in Nigeria and that it was time to move elsewhere. And he took a fateful decision to do that. Uh, so without further ado, I'm just going to turn to Fabiola first. Yes, of course. And you just press the little button here. Okay. <clears throat> so Fabiola, tell us a little bit about your personal story. Okay. How did you end up in, uh, in Switzerland? Because sometimes, People have an image of what uh, a migrant is, and they just all they can think of is what they saw on Al Jazeera or CNN, people being rescued out of a rubber dinghy or not. But as we all know in this room, migration is a far more complex picture, and I think we're going to hear a little bit about that. Yes. Well, good morning to all the presents here. I'm so grateful for IOM for being here. Well, my history is making a long story short, is that I met my husband in Brazil. He is a Swiss man. And so I came here to Switzerland and I lived in for 17 years here, nine years in Freiburg and nine year, eight years in Lausanne. Uh, but uh, I divorced, uh, we divorced after uh, five years. And uh, I had uh, a job, but I lost the job I had, so I had to go back to Brazil. And I decided to implement a language school to share with people uh, a little bit of the culture and uh, the tongues that uh, I acquired here while I lived here in Switzerland. Right. So, I mean, what we're hearing about is a professional. So it's a completely different picture than you quite often hear about migrants. And, of course, the... The uh, eternal story of love is at the heart of it. And I think quite often when people talk or think about migration, they're simply thinking economic migrants trying to get a job, moving across the borders, don't know why they're doing it, why are they breaking the rules, they should go home. That's kind of the, pop the popular narrative. But in fact, the truth is it's a much more complex picture. Yes. So tell us a little bit about what happened to you after you lost your job. After I lost my job. Oh. Thank you. I lost my job in 2014. I worked in a private bank in Lausanne. It went into bankruptcy in 2014. And also I lost my dad. And I wanted to live again, with, to live with my, mam, my mom. She was aging. And I wanted to, to go back home and to enjoy this time with family. So what... What made me what made me to take the decision was going back home and living with my family again. So I think what we're touching on here is a, is something that is often not considered in the big debate about migration is that personal decisions. People feel they're very far from their family. Their parents are getting old. In this case, Fabiola's dad passed away. Her mother was alone, and they're living irregularly or they can't continue and they want to find a way home. So I think quite often the debate and the discussion about migrants is quite often a binary one. Send them home where they're taking our jobs. But in fact, it's not the case whatsoever. It's a personal request and decision to be reunited with family. So how did, how did you end up moving? How what was the next step in the journey? So uh, I want to go home, but, but I was 35 and I felt so old. I didn't get my uh, college degree and it's so difficult to find a job in Brazil without a college degree. So uh, 
I started to, to have this idea to, to create a language school and uh, to help people that couldn't afford uh, a language school, a private language school in Brazil that's so expensive, to come to my school that's three times uh, lower, the price is three right. times lower than uh, the other schools right. 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 in the city. So um, you're bringing your, micro, your experience, uh, you, the languages you've learned, Very you've learned true. beautiful English as we can hear, and obviously fluent French. Yes. And you're teaching, you're going to be teaching in this lovely school at different levels. You're going to start at a basic yes. level. Yes. For, for English people, uh, for, for English students, I just uh, give it to the beginners, to, to till the three years, till they can get the first cer certificate of uh, Cambridge, and French till the advanced level, so they can get the DALF, the Diploma Avancé avanc de Langue Française. So your journey home began then with a meeting or hearing about IOM, and tell us a little bit about how that happened. Well, as I lost my job uh, and I couldn't find uh, another job so easily here in Switzerland because I was working in Portuguese with a, uh, with a Portuguese ba bank, I went to the social, social ser service that gave me, indicated me uh, IOM so they could help me if I had uh, a project to go on. So what, you've, what we're talking about is the IOM Assisted Voluntary Return and Reintegration Program which has been you know, really growing in strength and growing in understanding uh, that it's a truly voluntary process that helps, I think it helps in the fluidity of migration because as we're hearing, people get stuck. They get stuck in their lives and they want to go home to their family and they need a route home. Uh, and quite often the, the, you know, we, the, there's a misunderstanding of what AVRR means, in some cases deliberate misunderstanding maybe. But this is a very interesting case. So we're going to move across now to Augustine. We'll come back to you in a minute. So Augustine, you tell us a little bit about your story. So you were you you also ran into hard economic times in in Nigeria. Yeah, uh, 2015 uh, was a very 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 difficult year for my country. Uh, after the change of power from one uh, party to another, uh, there was a problem of militancy. Uh, we are Nigeria major resources, major, Nigeria major revenue was uh, blocked by the people from the Niger Delta. Uh, they were exploited, they were bombing oil pipeline and everything. So there was economical strugulation in my country. Uh, the country was no longer exporting oil, uh, so there was no money coming in. Uh, so it was very, very difficult for someone who has been having three meals per day to even have one. So having, uh, so companies, we are retrenching workers, uh, people, companies who was up to 100, 200. We are now reducing the worker, or their workers to maybe something like 50 to 20, just to keep on, you stand. So it is very difficult for, uh, when companies retrench, it is very difficult to get a new job. So people are losing their jobs. So uh, when this happens, then migration begins. So when I lost my job, so for a couple of months, I could not get another job. So the best uh, thing I have to think, uh, okay, maybe I should go to a neighboring, neighboring country, or maybe I should go to Europe. So at the end of the day, I decided to go to Europe uh, through the desert. Uh, so from there, that was how my migration journey began. So let me just interrupt. So I think the perception we often have is that those leaving for Europe yeah. are the poorest of the poor the people with really no hope. But in fact, what you're telling us is that here you are, a professional, you were a political activist, you were a journalist, you decided to, to go. I mean, is that, is that typical? Were you typical of those who were taking this very risky journey? Yeah. Migration is a journey of hope, but ends in despair. So at the beginning, uh, let, me, let me just say, last year, or two years ago, uh, Africans are not really informed about the dangers of irregular migrations. We don't really know what is going to happen at the other side. Uh, we, only, uh, we only have the idea that, okay, we can easily cross to the other side and everything. So uh, uh, when I was uh, going to Europe, so I took uh, the desert and everything. So I never knew that, uh, is going to end in despair. Okay. 
So you were maybe lucky insofar as you decided not to go to Libya, you decided to go to Algeria. Yeah. Now, why did you not go to Libya? How, what were you learning along the way? So when I was on my way, I had different stories about what is happening in Libya, the modern day slavery, you'll be kidnapped, you'll be electrocuted, then you'll be, uh, you'll be giving phones to call your family, your stand and everything. So I decided, oh, maybe I should uh, seek for another route. Uh, then I find another route which is more safe, which is more secure and everything. So I migrated through the other routes. Okay. So communication, um, yeah, communication is obviously a very important thing. What sources of information do these mig do migrants have as you travel along? Are you, are you on Facebook, for example, or are you hearing it on the radio? Or is it just peer-to-peer -peer people talking to each other? Let me just say, the social media plays a very vital role, an important role in migrating in the life of all migrants. We are being hegemonized. We pick things from the social medias. You understand? So uh, the social media, is what we see on the social media, it is not what it is. So people began to migrate from what they see on the social media. You understand? So uh, for, let me just say, for example, I'm in Switzerland. You understand? I go to the street of Switzerland. I take good pictures and post it on the internet. And nobody knows what I'm doing here in Switzerland. Maybe I'm working fine. You understand? Maybe I got a job. Maybe I do this or that. Nobody knows. So they only pick that if this person could be in Europe, I can also be in Europe. So no matter what you tell them, no matter what, even at the beginning of the journey, we still, 70% of people knows the dangers of this journey, you understand? But due to what we've got in the social media, we have been hegemonized. So Africans do anything to get to the final destination. So we need to know a little bit more about communication. But before we go deeper into that, we're going to give you a treat and give you, show you, play two videos which show the lives of these two fantastic young people. Uh, let's start with uh, Fabiola. Como meu pai faleceu em 2012 e o banco que eu trabalhava fez falência em 2014, foi aí que eu comecei a pensar que era o momento de voltar para casa e ficar com a minha família. Eu tinha muito medo de voltar e não saber o que fazer. Foi aí que eu pensei em fazer esse projeto de montar uma escola que pudesse popularizar duas línguas e oferecer a preço baixo o aprendizado de línguas para pessoas que não poderiam ter acesso a outra escola E além disso, eu fiquei muito feliz de saber que eu estava trazendo para o meu país algo que eu tinha aprendido lá. De trazer uma língua, que é o francês, que eu aprendi na Suíça. Foi maravilhoso, porque eles me acolheram com, com um carinho imenso e com muito, com, me deram muita segurança. Então eu vejo essa escola com muitos alunos, muitos formandos, muitos alunos tendo diploma de inglês ou diploma de francês contribuindo assim com o objetivo inicial meu, que era de fazer algo para melhorar nosso país, para trazer algo, me sentir útil à sociedade brasileira e contribuir para o crescimento desse país que eu amo tanto. As minhas andanças, parece que as minhas andanças, o, a minha experiência fora, tudo isso me preparou para o meu desafio de agora, para o momento que eu estou vivendo hoje. Thank you so much. Yes. So let's let's hear. Let's see what's happening in uh, Nigeria with Augustine. I just want to go. I just want to leave. I just want to find a greener pasture. There's something more better. You understand? Then uh, I bought a bus to Agadez. The way you're being smuggled was the hardest part of the journey. 30 people at the back of the Elos vehicle. 30 people. The driver took my camera, took my money and everything, then dropped us at the desert. It was above 45 degrees. You understand? Something that is above 45 degrees, your skin is burning. When I got to Algeria, then I began to see the risks of the journey. That even the one I've just passed through is just a preamble. Who can swim the Mediterranean Sea? No one. Then I said, no, I can't. I have a lovely mom who does not know me and, me and mine. I just have to go back home and start a new life. Why internet radio? I got my inspiration during the journey when I was in Agadez, uh, during the IUM center. 
when I met up to 5,000 people, people were coming, we were going, people went to prisons, people who were their brothers, their loved ones was killed by their sides. 80% of people did not know the risks of that journey. They don't know the dangers of that journey. I then thought it is better for me to go back home to sensitize Nigeria. And I'm happy that uh, I have achieved something. Great. Well, thank you so much. I think these are terrific videos, which we're going to be spreading around. You'll be getting them in your inboxes any day now <coughs> as we try and explain to people the, the values and the incredible benefit that uh, assisted voluntary return brings. Fabiola, tell us a little bit about what you think, you know, what is the kind of message you would like to give to the world about your journey? Oh, a message. Leonard, it may seem naive, but in my case, uh, if I have learned a lesson, is that everywhere, or almost, almost everywhere, not everywhere, but almost everywhere, can be paradise. Uh, of course, people was speaking to me all the time, are you crazy to leave Switzerland? Switzerland is the rich uh, country, is developed, uh, and you go back to Brazil. But I really think that everywhere can be paradise if you have the, p the people you love and that you are loved in return. So for me, paradise now is in Brazil, where I am with my family and near relatives, but I will always keep Switzerland in my heart, and it will always be a second home for me. Wonderful. And in, in, in your society, when you go back home, do you hear a lot of negative conversations about migrants? Is there a lot of misunderstanding about what migration is? There are indeed a lot, a lot of misunderstandings. In my country, for example, uh, the country is crossing a difficult pe period, period now, and uh, everybody was asking to me the same question all the time. How could I go back to Brazil? How, how, where did I get the courage to go back to Brazil? But uh, it was... And so tell us, what's the $5 million question? <laughs> what's the answer to the $5 million question? <laughs> what do you tell people when you get that question? That uh, I, I need to go back. I need to live with my family. Right. So you need to live with your own society. Yeah. Agustin, you're in the hot seat now, and as a, as a seasoned journalist, yeah. I know I can ask you what your takeaways are. What is the takeaway for your extraordinary migration journey and, and, and what you brought back and what you're trying to do? Uh, let me say, irregular migration, the journey does not worth it. You understand? Africa is a continent of hope. It's a continent of hard-working people. You understand? Instead of we migrating irregularly, we can stay back home and develop whatever we had. Look at the Europe. They develop whatever they had. With good, they hold their leaders accountable for everything. If we can do the same in Africa, in the next five years to 10 years, I believe even Everybody in Europe will migrate to Africa. So let me, let, let, let me say, Africa is the continent of hope. It is a continent of hardworking people. So we don't need to migrate irregularly. The journey does not worth it. It takes your life. It takes your happiness. It takes everything away from you. Let us stay back home and develop whatever we have. It is only we that can develop our country. Nobody will develop it for us. Africa is a very rich, without Africa, the world won't be where it is today. We are talking of uh, people, even the people who have changed the world, we are talking of people like, the people who have changed the world, them, whatever they used to change the world was developed from Africa. So let's just do this thing together. Let's also develop Africa. I think we have a lot of work to do with you when you go back home. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll have to be in touch. So the message really is that, you, that contrary to many of the, the media tropes that uh, that are so easily thrown around about what Africa is. It's a far more complex picture, yeah. and there's plenty of opportunity to make your life there. Yeah. So how do you, in practice, tell your peers back home, and are they listening to you? Are they still dazzled by the bright lights of El Dorado? Let me say, at the beginning of my journey, we were not informed about the dangers of irregular migrations. Let me, let me say so, uh, 70 to 80 percent of people those cannot even differentiate between irregular and regular migrations. So the, the mentality we all had 
was that, oh, if I can just get to my final destination, if I can get to Europe, life begins to change for me. That is why I said the social media plays a very vital role in these journeys of irregular migrations. That is why even though we are going to start sensitizing Nigerians and Africans and all, everybody all over the world, because it is a global issue, it is, it is, a, it is an issue that needs a global collaboration, be it from wherever you are, be it from Europe, be it from uh, Africa, be it from the Middle East or something. So we must come together. And that is what I have seen the IOM are doing. Because migration with, my, with IOM going to 166 countries or 160 countries, you understand, and in these migration jobs shows that there is a unity in among countries. So the thing we have to do, okay, the things we have to do is to go back home and use these same social media that are using uh, they, they're using to deceive the people, mostly the connection men, you stand, and also use it to sensitize Africans about the dangers of this journey. So I just wanted to ask you, at what point in your optimistic, because you are an optimistic fellow, we can see that, at what time in your optimistic journey to Europe did you say, this is not a great idea? What was your darkest hour? Yeah, when, when, when I got uh, to a part of the journey, and I, and I heard different things about Libya, how people were sold for modern day slavery, how people were beaten, how people were electrocuted. And I said, I have a better country. Even though things, my country is facing struggulation, I can go back home and do something. So at, at, at that place, I said, no, the journey does not worth it. Let me go back home. <clears throat> One thing that's often said to us is that once migrants have committed to taking this journey, it's very hard for them to turn back because of a feeling of personal shame. Maybe they've borrowed money from their family. Maybe their mother has, you know, mortgage, sold something. How do you, how, do, if not, how does that work for you and how do you think it works for others going home? Let me, let me say, let me make an instant when I was at the IOM Center in Agadez, when I met 5,000 people. I, IOM is doing a very good job, uh, to be sincere. When I met 5,000 people, even though when people know the risks of this journey, 10% to 20% we still want to go. Because when they look back home, there's nothing to go back to. Yes, and that is why if we must talk about the dangers of irregular migration, if we must sensitize Africans about the dangers of irregular migration, we also are going to talk about the solutions, which is youth empowerment, skills acquisitions. We must give them something to do. We must give them hope that, okay, once you go back home, there will be something you can do to assist yourself and your family. Yes, and so, uh, because, sorry, uh, because once you are in the middle of this journey, and even when you are aware of these dangers, when you look back home, who are you going to meet? You spent, you borrowed money, you spent all your money on this journey. Yes, and so I think the, the, the best uh, solution to this uh, thing is we, as we talk about the dangers, uh, we talk about the problem, we should also talk about the solutions. Thank you. So this has been a fascinating conversation of three people. We'd now like to bring in the audience a little bit more. And in particular, Director General Swing, I'd would I, could I invite you, would you like to ask any questions of our panelists? First of all, let me say thank you to both of you. It's, uh, uh, we have a lot of admiration for you and the courage you've had to start out on a journey and then to return and to try to learn from that experience, which I, look, I think that uh, we need to recognize that in this mobile, interconnected world, uh, we can both move and return, and we can both be an active uh, migrant abroad contributing there, but also contributing back home through remittances and skills transfer and other things. In other words, uh, you can be and fully integrated into the local society and still not forget where you come from and contribute back home. And that, that's the whole idea is that we live in a fluid world and we have many identities, we can have many nationalities, we can speak many languages. But I think uh, what both of you are showing us is that you've made the effort, you've made the journey, you've benefited from that because you've learned something from it. And what you've learned, you've taken back home now, I was just in uh, Obok in Djibouti, and I interviewed a number of primarily Ethiopian migrants. And I said to them, I said, look, 
you're going to cross the Red Sea, which is turbulent. You may lose your life by drowning. You're going to get to Yemen, and you cannot get across the border to Saudi Arabia where you're heading for. And you're going to get into trouble. We may have to bring you back. So why are you going? And they said very much what uh, both of you have said. Uh, I'm going because uh, it's worse back there than where I'm heading. In other words, the, you know, the opportunities at home were not enough. So this, these are messages for countries of origin, countries of destination, and organizations like IOM that we have to begin to address the drivers, what drives people to go out on what I would call forced migration. Regular migration, 90% of all the migration in the world is regular, it's safe, regular, orderly, et cetera. But for that group that feel there's, there's no hope, uh, then we have to address those drivers of migration, including increasingly climate change, as we learned yesterday. So, uh, as, uh, and, and what bothers me every time I go, I was just in Agadez, I know what, exactly what you're talking about. It's a great center. We've returned 8,000 from Agadez. We've returned 13,600 from Libya, people who wanted to go home. But um, I think um, one needs to benefit from this, draw the experience, and as you're doing, both of you are doing, through your school, your language school, and through your radio, you're giving people a chance to benefit from that. Now, what scares me, though, every time I go to some of the countries, particularly in Africa, is I see uh, joblessness, no livelihood possibility for young people. The family has been working the same land for generations. The land has gotten poor and poor and less and less possibility to earn a living through agriculture, which should be the first possibility. And then I see that the median age in Niger, where Agadez is located, is 14. Average person, uh, average mother is having six children. Uh, I, the median age, 14. The median age in Europe is 47. So somewhere there has to be a connection between the demographic divide and migration. Now it's going to be handled. Well, I think that's fascinating, and it brings us on to the subject of circular migration, really. And I think what a very powerful message that our two guests can bring to the world, and we'll help them do that, is that it's not necessarily a one-way street migration, and that it's a, big, it's a big learning journey, and you learn so much to bring back to your country of origin and to add to it. Of course, it's not going to solve the problems of unemployment, which are horrendous in many parts of the world. But I think the perception of migrants can be changed. And two voices like this can certainly show to the world uh, that you know, the migrant in your head is not necessarily the actual migrant. And maybe there's an opportunity to change the set, change the, change the setting on what we consider migrants to be, and that they are huge drivers of innovation if they're allowed to go back home. And uh, uh, we mentioned the, the diaspora remittances. But um, tell us a little bit of your reaction to, to, to that, to the Director General. But what do you think? You're, like you're a good example of bringing something back. Is that welcomed, or are you seen as, an, as a, no, you should have stayed in Switzerland? It's very welcomed. And I'm so, I'm so happy to, have, to be in Brazil now, because people, they are, everybody that I speak about the school and uh, bringing this, this culture to Brazil, they are so happy, and they, they want so much to come to, to this school. So I'd like to encourage anybody who wishes to ask questions to please indicate with your, with your, um, with your sign. But uh, uh, tell us a little bit about your sense of what, it's a tougher case in your case, because you, you, know, you didn't spend that much, you didn't get to Europe, you didn't spend that much time here. But do, do you think th there's something that migrants learn on the journey and bring back? And do you th tell us a little bit, unpack a little bit about how you're going to be the driver of economic growth? Okay, uh, I think there are a lot of things to learn from the journey. Mostly uh, taking the route I took, you're talking of the pain, you're talking of how you were smuggled, you're talking of not uh, how you were matriculated, 
You understand? You, you got, uh, you, if you're not lucky, you meet the bandit. You understand? It's, take everything you, uh, you have. If you're a lady, you may be raped. And if you are not on the lucky side as a guy, you may be sued for slavery or you may be kidnapped. So, and, and I just thank God that there's a huge awareness now going on about uh, these dangers of irregular migration couples to what happens, in, what is uh, happening in Libya now and everything. So there are much things to learn, the pain and the agony and everything. You may go without returning, uh, you may end up dying at the desert. So as for this, we want, that is why we want everybody to stay back home and develop whatever they have. And uh, we want to empower as much we can empower. So we will not just be uh, talking about uh, the problem, we will also create solutions to the problem. That is empowering people, you understand? Uh, giving those people who want to go to school, we make sure they go to school uh, with the support of our local governments and NGOs. So you were telling me uh, in the green room that in your journey, you, when you finally reached Algeria, things were not so easy. There wasn't a, a lot of acceptance of sub-Saharan Africans. Uh, that seems to be the case in so many countries, not just to pick on one country, where there's resistance to the incomers. Maybe you could ex just talk a little bit about, in general terms, about what it's like to be not welcome. And of course, in your own country, there are migrants coming from all over West Africa as well. Do they feel welcome? In my own, in my own country, everybody feels welcome. Uh, when I was in uh, Algeria, uh, it is a good country, very good country, uh, a country of law. Uh, they have laws and we all respect their law. <coughs> but uh, a migrant is still a migrant. Mostly once you migrate irregularly, without papers mm -hmm. and everything. So, uh, you know, once an irregular migrant, uh, when, when you say you're not welcome is uh, when you don't have necessary papers. Uh -huh. You don't have jobs. Um, because if you migrate regularly, uh, there will be jobs. There was a reason you migrated and you are going to get wh why you migrated. So, because migration has the two sides, the regular side and the irregular side. But fortunately, I, fell, I fall into the irregular side, which uh, whatever I pass through the journey, the blame should be on me, not in the country, you understand? So, as for that, I won't really be welcome into the country because I, I'll, be, I'll be running away from the police. Uh, I'll be running away from many things and everything. But if I was a regular migrant, I would just tender my paper or my card and I'll be welcomed. Uh, we, the Director General spoke about the, you know, the, the huge youth demographic in, in, in Africa. W looking forward, what do, you, what do you see happening? I mean, the w does there have to be a, a, a change, a massive change in the economic growth in Africa? Or are we going to see more and more people making this irregular journey and getting into trouble? As Africa it is now, Africa is growing politically. When, because you can't talk about Africa without adding politics to it. What is happening all over the country, the elections and everything. So uh, these are also one of the causes of irregular migrations. When you're talking of war, <coughs> you're talking of many things. So it's, it's going to take uh, a long way for us to solve this problem. You stand, uh, and that is why we should always expect migrants from Africa until when we get our economy right, until when we get our political system right. Because uh, let me just say our politicians are selfish, you understand? Uh, this is one of the reasons why we're going to have, because if you have a, if, apart from economy, politically, if you have an, a, a political war in the country, uh, people does not have choice than think of migrations. So uh, as we are also solving the problem of economy in every country, we should also please put things together and solve uh, African political system. Thank you. So I think you're saying that economic stability, political stability are very important. It's very, 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 very important. Political, you understand? Because you, you can't talk about economy without talking about politics. Yeah. Yeah. And you, you seem to be also saying that um, there needs to be an acceptance that there has to be some migration. Yeah. Because uh, inevitably people will want to move. As you said in this video, the grass is always greener. Yeah. Fabiola, going back to you, <coughs> you moved out of, uh, out of Amour Prop, um, but many Brazilians come here and many Brazilians travel all over the world. What is the experience? Experience. 
it's very rich. It's a very rich experience. Uh, now that I've lived here, uh, I, I lived here for 17 years. Uh, I know that I, I'm so grateful for this experience because I know that I look the world with complete uh, new eyes. I would I wouldn't never look the world with the world with the eyes I look today if I hadn't uh, have this experience. So I think what we're talking about is the challenge of how do you how do you balance between the need for migration, the huge enriching force that migration is, as we can see from these two wonderful people, and the and the lack of channels, the lack of legal routes, the lack of ability. I'm sure if you could have got a visa to Europe, you would have jumped at it and yeah. made a big contribution here. Yeah. <laughs> and maybe that's the big debate that has to happen: is how yeah. do we open up the channels so that people can migrate regularly and indeed return? Because you migrated regularly at the yes. beginning. And you did not, but no. nonetheless, you both had a similar experience. If does anybody in the audience wish to comment at this point? Yeah. Oh, yes, please. Representative from Sudan, from Sudan you're very welcome. I'm, I'm just asking what, what is uh, the morale of the, of the two stories? Because there are thousands of uh, millions of migrants uh, represent the other side of the story. They are integrated in the host destination. Still, as Mr. Uh, Swing said, they are still contributing to the stability and development of their countries. So I just want to understand what is wrong if those two examples stay at the host destination and keep their life the same course, still having contact and link with their societies. I just want to know that the very the very meaning and the very morale of the story. You mean people never migrate or, or they don't uh, stay at host and go back? What is the last, uh, the core value of these uh, two examples? Well, for me, what I'm hearing uh, is that there need to be legal channels of migration. People need, want to, lo want to move, in this case because of love, as I keep saying, in this case because of a desire to get out of an economic difficulty. And if you can't migrate regularly, people will just do it. But there needs to be a political shift and an acceptance that migrants will come. And I think the wonderful moral of, uh, of this story here from, from Fabiola is that people go home. They, the, the, the notion in the media, I think, and I'm from that originally, is that it's a one-way street. But it's, of course, not a one-way street. It's, a, it's very much a two-dimensional two journey and an enriching one if, the, if it's allowed to happen. Anybody like to, would you like to comment further? I think we've said it all. Yeah. Anybody else comment? So, I mean, the, 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 the challenge, of course, we have is that so many people, for economic reasons, we've got two outstanding examples here, but so many people leave without much hope and without much information and end up in shocking difficulties. And I think that's what we've seen, seen this, this last couple of weeks with the, um, with the issue of Libya, where it's become a global issue an issue of moral conscience around the globe, that we cannot in this day and age tolerate uh, slave markets if that's what's happening, even if they're, wherever they are happening, anywhere in the world, we can't, dis we can't tolerate this happening in, under our watch. And so as a result of that, we have a massive political coming together this week in Abidjan between, at the initiative of the African Union, with the European Union support, with the UN Secretary General present, with the Security Council <coughs> backing it earlier in the week, and with the with IOM very much at the initiative of the Director General, <coughs> excuse me, to help take people out of a desperate situation, because at the end of the day, the conditions that people are living through in the detention centres are appalling. I've been there with the Director General, and we are in the nicer part of it, the pit that's organised by the government and is supported by aid from the European Union, aid from the United States, aid from all around the place. This is the better part of it, but the true story of what happens is very much hidden and we just get little glimpses of it and we really hope that the initiative to airlift between now and Christmas, the end of between now and the beginning of the year, 15,000 people, this is an air bridge of historic proportions and it's high time we had maybe better processes so that people aren't lured into this journey. Maybe you'd like to address that issue, Agustin. You know, we really have to find another way than to have people take the bus and be abused along the way. 
The only way is one thing. The answers are open already. What we did, what the IOM did at the, the Niger. He just let's look for the solutions. Let's talk less of the problem. Let's talk more on the solutions. Why are people migrating irregularly? The causes, the push factors, and everything. What IOM did, a wonderful, nice project in uh, Niger. You understand? We could expand this project around Africans and the world. You go to home to homes, those people who does not have jobs, you understand? You tell them, okay, what are you doing? Come, come to center. Those who want to go to school, they were given scholarship. Those who don't have skills, that wants to learn one or two things, they were given opportunity to acquire one or two skills. At the end of the day, they were given one or two things to start up business. And that was what IOM did at Niger. That was what I saw at Niger. So we could expand these frontiers. We are not saying we should invent the wheel. We are saying whatever we have, the ideas we have, let's expand it around Africa and around the world. Because if people have job, if you have what you're doing, you don't want to migrate. If you have a good family, you give them three square meals a day or two square meals a day, a lovely family, you want to migrate. Because migration has to do, irregular migration has to do with one factor. Is it, is it either you're passing through economic struggles, you don't have jobs, or you lose your jobs and it takes you a long while to get another job. And then the next thing, and if you don't want to involve in crime, because if you're on an employee, it's either you go to crime or something next. Like people like we that lost our jobs, we don't want to involve in crime. The next option is to migrate irregularly. So the option has been, is in place already. We just need uh, uh, IOM and all countries to expand it. Let's go to our society. Those people that want to acquire skills, let them give them skills. Those people that want to go to school, let us send them to school at the end of the day and let's empower them. That's all. Thank, Thank you. you. We'll wrap up the discussion in a few minutes, but I think you put your finger you know, right on the point that it's basically about economic development yeah. for economic security for families and the opportunity to have uh, projects, well-crafted projects. And I know that there's a huge focus now not just on the airlift of people out of Libya back home, but in their reintegration into the capacity to have, as you said, businesses. And for IOM working with all its UN partners to try and rebuild and help them reintegrate and, and uh, make a more sustainable yeah. economic picture out of it. I think that's very much what we see with Fabiola with her, with her English school and French school. Hi. It's extraordinary. So, I mean, uh, I think the big challenge now is how do we not just, it's always easier to, to break something than it is to fix something. And the real issue, I suppose, is how do we fix economies that are not functioning so well? How do we give people hope? How do we build apprenticeship schemes? How do we bring those back, those who are coming back, make sure that the small assistance they give isn't wasted, that they build something sustainable out of it? Yeah. Maybe you have some ideas. Yeah, well, uh, I will see repeat the same thing I just said. The, let, me, let me talk about, uh, let me just talk a little bit about my retrogression project. Just when uh, I got back to Nigeria, and I want to thank the Director General for, for you giving us this opportunity. Uh, when we retrograde back to our country, we have something doing, and remove the mentality of migrating again. I am so grateful uh, to the Council for this. Uh, let me talk about my retrogression project. When I got back to Na uh, Nigeria, you understand? I was asked, okay, what do you want to do? Why do you migrate? It's done. Okay, give us a proposal on what you could do. Uh, if you are not well uh, uh, into such projects, you will be trained for some time. You will be coached for some time. And you are going to, uh, they, were, they are going to blend you into the society. You understand? That's what, that, that was what I, uh, uh, happened to me in Nigeria. It took me a month, you understand, to get coached. Okay, if I was giving so, so much of money, how can I sustain the project? Okay, at the end of the day, if I need a little bank loan, this is how to uh, approach the bank. This, so it is sustainable. And that is what I found out about you. Now, whatever be a project that are uh, given to you, then make sure they see that it is sustainable and then make sure you see that how far you can develop, uh, you can grow this project, even employing those who does not have jobs. So I, 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 let me just say, we just need to expand these frontiers. The answers are there already. It, we don't need to look for the answers again. It is there. Let's tap into it and expand it.
How, how well said. There's nothing new under the sun. So when you go back to, to Brazil, are you left alone? And how do you set about setting up a school all by yourself? With that? How did that work? Uh, it was not easy to, to know what I was going to do to in Brazil when I, when I get back there. S uh, I went in 2016. Now there is one year and a half that I'm back in Brazil. But it was the most difficult decision, I think, in my life to, to go back, to leave Switzerland and to go back to, to Brazil. Uh, but uh, the, the help I had from IOM, it was essential because if, if I didn't have it, I don't think that I would have the courage really to, to go back. I would maybe stay in Switzerland because of the stable uh, work situation that the, the country has. Well, I, I, f I find this as the person who often speaks uh, on behalf of the Director General, I find it really interesting to have these two cases. We see media reports all the time, which quite often mischaracterize the, the role of AVR or the role of IOM, and it projected as something that we're not hearing today. I mean, this is very much, uh, it seems to me, to be a very holistic, to use a overused word, a very kind of organic uh, people being allowed to continue their lives and to grow in their lives thanks to some discreet help at the end of the day, which, of course, there's a long chain of people behind IOM. There are governments supporting this, there's host governments supporting it, and there are many hardworking IOM folk out in the field, and, of course, many uh, associate, many other NGOs who work closely with IOM and other agencies. There's a big tapestry behind what seems to be a very simple fix. But to make a simple fix work, it takes a lot of coordination, and I know that from seeing my IOM colleagues working hard at making sure that their projects are very well regulated, well, well organized, and well administered. So at that, unless there are more questions from the audience, I'm going to allow you to go to your lunch, because you've all been waiting very patiently. And thank you. I want to really thank, above all, Fabiola, especially, thank very much, for your extraordinary story. and. Uh, no less thank Augustine for telling us an amazing story from a different part of the world. And thank you all for your great patience and listening and enjoying it. Thank you.